the largest law enforcement mobilization in the history of the United States, that was obviously disproportionate because it wasn't the worst riot that year, not even close. But the day itself, there was something about January 6th that didn't feel right. And hovering over that day has remained the question, to what extent was it a setup? And we still don't really know. But what's interesting is how few people have asked that entirely legitimate question. One of the very few, really one of the only in the United States Congress, is a member called Clay Higgins from Louisiana. And in case you haven't seen this clip, it's worth rewatching. This is from 2022 in a Homeland Security Committee hearing where he asked it just directly of the FBI director. Watch. Did the FBI have confidential human sources embedded within the January 6th protesters on January 6th of 2021? Well, Congressman, as I'm sure you can appreciate, I have to be very careful about what I can say about when. Even we are. now, because that's what you I, told us two years finish? ago. May I finish? Uh, about when we do and do not, and where we have and have not used confidential human sources. Uh, but to the extent that there's a suggestion, for example, that the FBI's confidential human sources or FBI employees in some way instigated or orchestrated January 6th, that's categorically false. Did you have confidential human sources dressed as Trump supporters inside the Capitol on January the 6th prior to the doors being open? Again, I had to be very careful. It should be a no. Can you not tell the American people? No, we did not have confidential human sources dressed as Trump supporters positioned inside the Capitol. Gentlemen's time has expired. You should not read anything into my decision uh, not to share information. Director Ray, confidential human gentlemen's sources. time has expired. What a sleazy, repulsive little authoritarian liar Chris Ray is. That's obvious when you watch that tape. The sad part is so few tapes like that exist because so few have confronted him directly and asked questions to which the entire country has a right to know the answer, like that one. Clay Higgins did that. Congressman from Louisiana, Louisiana Lafayette, joins us in studio. Congressman, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me, Tuck. So that was over a year ago that you asked that question, which is a central question, and you asked it as I think is appropriate without any embarrassment at all on behalf of your constituents and the rest of the country. Are you any closer to the answer now? Well, we're closer to being in a position where we can reveal the answers that we already have. Um, much of the evidence that we have compiled from investigative effort and over the, the course of the last couple of years, some offices like my own would have operated in silos of investigative endeavor. Um, have now been able to come together now that we have a Republican majority and we have access to the to the to the staffs of the appropriate investigative committees and so I sit on the oversight committee and we Republicans run that committee now and therefore we control the staff so when you can magnify the efforts that individual uh, members of Congress have have have, pushed within our own offices, when you can magnify those efforts by the, the skill and the numbers of staff from the committees, you, you, you get a lot of evidence reviewed professionally and aligned and assembled into a, essentially a case file. And in, in this case, this is a big file because the, the, the involvement of, of certain actors you could say deep state actors within the federal government to set the stage for uh, what happened in, in J four, five, and six, and and to um, entrap thousands of Americans from across the country and lure them into this this set stage on J four, five, and six. The people that were involved in that is is is, is quite a large web. So, yes, sir, we do have a great deal of evidence compiled, and we are, we are gradually, professionally uh, rolling that evidence out. So you sort of answered the question right there in larger terms. You just said that elements within the federal government, I assume law enforcement, intel, and military, and I'm using your words, lured Americans to Washington into what you called a trap. Yes, sir. So that would, I mean, that's a shocking, and I assume that's a, that's a sober conclusion based on the evidence. That's what you're saying. 
That's that would be my sober assessment as an investigator, and a you know I'm quite a I love my country and and I I've, I've always been a staunch defender of the thin blue line, and I I would proudly count the FBI amongst that number. It's like brothers to me. So to find that level of uh, of conspiratorial corruption at the highest levels of the FBI uh, has been very troubling to me as a man, as a cop. And and yet, you know, you follow the evidence wherever it leads. And yes, this is what investigators do. So uh, when I asked Christopher Ray that, that question, for instance, I, I already knew the answer. I had reviewed compelling evidence that the that FBI had assets, human assets, dressed as Trump supporters inside the Capitol prior to the doors being open and the masses allowed in. Uh, so I, I knew that the FBI was deeply involved. I'd seen evidence even at that time with uh, that the FBI had embedded themselves into various groups online across the country of Americans who were essentially uh, voicing their their concerns and airing their grievances with each other about COVID oppression. And those Americans were targeted by the FBI, though almost universally Republicans and, and uh, largely Trump supporters, but the FBI worked undercover to infiltrate those conversations and become a significant part of those individual Americans' uh, communications. And when you dig into the evidence that we've, we've had revealed through, through some criminal cases that I've, I've followed and worked with the families of J6 uh, political detainees and Americans that have been persecuted for their involvement in, in the Capitol that day, and some of that evidence is shockingly reveals that the, the the FBI agents that were operating undercover within the online groups across the country were were the first ones to plant the seeds of of uh, suggestions of of a of a more radical occupation of the Capitol, and and they were sort of testing the waters of who amongst that group would would begin acknowledging that you know yeah maybe, maybe we should do that maybe we should plan for an occupation like that but if you look at the the origins of those conversations they they were started by the the FBI undercover guy that was operating inside the group and then months later uh on January 4th 5th and 6th Many of those Americans met for the first time in person when they gathered for the massive rally where American patriots assembled to object to, to everything that had happened during 2020, the COVID oppression, and the, the stunning results of what we believe was a compromise election cycle in November 2020. So Americans gathered at their own capital to to appropriately air grievances and protests at their capital, but embedded amongst their number was an FBI asset that had been working from within their group online for many months. So this was the level of uh, of manipulative effort that the FBI invested into American citizenry and our our assembly online to our, to exercise our rights under the First Amendment to talk to each other about whatever we want to talk about, including the the, the insidious oppressions of COVID that we were suffering across the country. So, and our concerns about where the election was going, the whole mail-in ballot thing, we could see the stage was being set for a compromised election cycle, possibly, and to our horror, that's what happened. So FBI had fingerprints on this thing from for many months prior to J4, 5, and 6. I want to go back to something you said in the first sentence, which is 
you have seen evidence, and that spurred your questions to Chris Ray, that there were FBI assets dressed as Trump supporters within the Capitol. So that is proof of entrapment, because of course the federal government could have prevented entry into the Capitol building. There aren't that many doors. You work there, you know. But they allowed people in on purpose to entrap them. That's what that proves, I think. Does it not? Well, it's certainly condemning. It's another piece of the of the strategy that the that the government employed to sort of complete the entrapment of Americans that they had had uh, infiltrated and then prodded and provoked with online with the with the, those original seeds planted of of uh, actions like you know what type of gear to wear and 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 just to, in language that incited behavior that could go the wrong way you know pushing actions of of legal and legitimate peaceful protest to an edge where where those Americans would likely not have gone had they not been been you know encouraged by the FBI plant amongst their number that they didn't know was there so by the time it was actually J6 and you had you had uh, masses of Americans assembled outside the Capitol, um, almost like 99.9%, 100% peaceful. On the inside, you had FBI assets dressed as Trump supporters that knew their way around the Capitol. Before the doors even opened. Before the doors opened. Or else, how are you going to get around the Capitol? You've been there many times. You need a guide. To get from whatever door you go in, it's a labyrinth. It's 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 a maze inside there. So you, that's right. So there's no way, just Americans, most of which have never been to the Capitol, there's no way they can come in some random door that gets opened and then get their way directly to the to the statuary or the House chamber or the Senate chamber. It's, it's just not possible. So the 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 FBI assets that were dressed as Trump supporters that were inside the Capitol were there, I believe, and evidence indicates that they were there to to specifically wave in the the Trump supporters that had gathered outside the Capitol and the doors opened and they were allowed in. And on the inside were, were oh, there's some more Trump supporters, but really those were FBI assets, law enforcement assets that knew their way around the Capitol. And they, they waved those guys in Say, come on, follow us, and they, they're the ones that led them on the path directly. How do you think a guy has never been to the Capitol, gonna gonna come into the Capitol all amped up on on emotion, and make his way straight to Nancy Pelosi's office? Come on, it's like I couldn't get it. There's no way. I've been there for seven years. Could come in some random door at the Capitol and make my way to Nancy Everything Pelosi. Everything is unmarked. I mean, those leadership offices are unmarked. So how would it, you know it's that? confusing That's to get right. around in the Capitol. Every American that has been there knows this. When you go on a tour, you bring your family to D.C., you go through the Capitol, you have to have a guide. And and on January 6th, the guides were FBI assets, the law enforcement assets. And they were dressed as Trump supporters. They were positioned inside the Capitol prior to the doors being opened so that the Americans that had assembled outside the Capitol, once allowed in, could be brought directly to the areas where the FBI and the DOJ and the deep state actors knew would be the most uh, the most sort of condemning criminal action of of Americans being a lot being inside the Capitol. Um, protesting without permit and things. So they knew they were setting the stage for arrest and prosecution. It's such a crime. Who who planned this, do you think? Well, I think factions planned this. I wldn't say who, Tucker, because yeah, I don't think there was one person that, that, that planned this, but I believe the, the faction of uh, establishment liberals within the, the 
FBI and the Democrat Party and our intelligence services to, to another extent um, use their massive powers of surveillance and, uh, in, and investigative uh, assets that they have across the country, confidential informants, registered informants, non-registered informants, voluntary informants, it's a, it's a, it's a, a complex web of, of FBI assets across the country that can be activated. So if you have authority at some of the highest levels in the FBI, it doesn't take much. The faction within the FBI and within our intelligence services that would coordinate with, with the most extreme liberal uh, factions within a Democrat party that were desperate to keep Trump out of office and, and you know, worked within the, the theater of operations, shall we say, that had been, that had been set by the COVID alleged medical emergencies nationwide and millions and millions of mail-in ballots. There's no daylight between the the compromised election cycle of November 2020 and ultimately what happened on 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 J6 so you ask who planned this this would be the combination of several several of the most extreme liberal anti-Trump anti-America first factions that uh, that were in positions of authority within our our federal law enforcement organizations and the the Democrat Party across the country. Can when you say that there were FBI assets in the crowd, in in the building beforehand and and certainly outside, what's the scale of this? You're talking like ten, twenty? No. Um. Based upon some very conservative, but like hard investigative effort evaluation of of the numbers from putting together eyewitnesses and and videos and uh, and affidavit statement and whistleblower statements and uh, court records that have been revealed through individual criminal cases where J6 defendants have been prosecuted and Smart attorneys have forced uh, admissions by the DOJ and the FBI, but those admissions have been sealed within the parameter of that criminal case by protective order by the judge. So they, I, I can't share them, but I've seen them. So r- real hard, objective, and conservative um, estimates would would put the number of FBI assets in the crowd, outside, and working inside at at well over two hundred. Two hundred? Yeah. Yeah. So you were in law enforcement. Yeah. Yeah. Before you came to Congress in the military, as well. Um, that seemed that's an extraordinary number. Is it? Well, n- no. When you think about the scope of the operation, if you were going to do this, you would need you but, would need but that relative number. to so like when. I don't know, Minneapolis burned down or when St. John's, the Episcopal Church across from the White House in Lafayette Square was set ablaze and all the Secret Service agents were injured. Were there 200 FBI assets in the crowd among Antifa then? I mean, I, I don't know how many undercover agents the FBI would have in a situation like that. But to, but 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 J6 was the was the was the final act prior to arrest and prosecution of of Americans that that were identified as as Trump supporters I mean the objective was to des- destroy the entire mega movement to to forever stain the uh, the patriotic fervor that was associated with with the America first mega movement that had 
one in 2016, and we believe one again in 2020. And the, the establishment uh, on both sides, of both major parties, were determined to, to smash that out of existence, not just by defeating Trump, but by destroying the, uh, the reputations of the movement itself by creating this narrative that it was totally false uh, but but was heavily pushed that the that mega republicans america first republicans are somehow a danger to our republic and a, a domestic terror threat there's a whole nother story about what the fbi has done to tagging americans as uh suspected domestic terrorists and and following us as we travel across the country. But the, the bottom line is that uh, 200, as a, I, I believe, is a conservative number. First of all, I think there were, there were many more. But the, a number that I'm comfortable going on record with is that we believe that there were, that there were easily 200 FBI undercover assets operating in the crowd, uh, outside the Capitol, embedded into groups that entered the Capitol or provoked entry of the Capitol and working with FBI assets that would have included Metro Police and Capitol Police that would dress as Trump supporters inside the Capitol because those were the guys that knew their way around the Capitol. So given the scope of the operation and the number of, of doors where uh, entry was allowed or e even encouraged, um, then the, and the number of people that were actually outside the Capitol and it entered, we believe 200 is a conservative number. Yes, sir. It's it's shocking what you're saying. It confirms everyone's worst suspicions about this. It's clearly true. Um, did you come across any evidence that the, the DOD, the military, either Defense Intelligence Agency or National Guard or any part of the U.S. military played any role in this at all? I have not seen that. Um, I've heard the echoes of that suspicion, and I have, I have observed um, circumstantial evidence that that has been presented to me that I that I have reviewed, but to but to me, um, it does not rise to the level of, that I would call um, actionable from an investigative perspective. So there's some there was some some suspicion, but in 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 law enforcement, the thresholds you're looking across is reasonable suspicion. That would prompt a, a criminal investigation, and then the next threshold is probable cause, which you need for arrest. And then, of course, in our system, finally, the last threshold is is uh, co is conviction and guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. So, the, I I did review evidence, Tucker, re regarding uh, some suspicions of military involvement in some way, but and I and I've. I have reviewed some of that evidence that that has been that I've been able to get my hands on, and I do not think that the, the military was uh, was involved. Not at the level, most certainly not at the level of the, of the FBI, and uh, over the course of all of 2020, and then on J four, five, and six the FBI working in coordination with other law enforcement assets that that they roped into the operation right. from Metro PD from DC and and uh the Capitol Police was sort of uh sort of tricked into participating with the with what the FBI had been staging for you know 10 months it just I mean, if you take three steps back this is not democracy. So the federal agencies serve under the oversight of the elected president and then un under the oversight of the elected Congress. Their elected people get to make the decisions. You have a Republican president, you now have a Republican Congress, and neither one can get a straight answer from the FBI. No, no one has any control of the FBI. You're describing a government within a government. Well, 
in America, a question becomes reasonable men would, would, would ask when we face a crisis like this, who investigates the investigator? Right. And the answer in America is, is Congress. So we, we have the responsibility to investigate through the appropriate committees, which would, we're certainly, we're certainly doing that now that we have a Republican majority in control of the committees. But we don't have the power to arrest. We can, we can give criminal referrals based upon our investigative efforts, but we have to have a DOJ that's receptive to the criminal referrals. So we, we've hit quite a, a brick wall, have we not? It, constitutionally, it, we, we have the responsibility to investigate objectively, and, and, and anyone that knows me it knows that's exactly what I'm, I'm pursuing. I do not have, I'm not trying to create a crime to fit a narrative to blame on the FBI. I'm following the evidence, and, and to my horror, it implicates our FBI at the highest level and, a, and a, a, a conspiracy within our government at the highest level to create the, the uh, to set the stage for a compromised election cycle in 2020 and then the, the, the actions that took place on J4, 5, and, and 6. And then the the criminal investigation, arrest, and prosecution of Americans that they were able to entrap and document with the thousands of cameras that were operating that day and use that evidence that they knew they were setting up to investigate, arrest, and prosecute the Americans that they had entrapped. So Congress can investigate these things, and we, and we are, and we will reveal these horrific truths, and we will have criminal referrals. But until you have a, 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 a president running the executive branch that will clean house at the DOJ and FBI at the highest levels and put American patriots in place that will, be, that will act upon the criminal referrals that, that Congress provides, then none of those guys are going to get arrested because they're not going to arrest themselves, and we don't have arrest authority. I'm a little surprised, and, and don't expect to be critical of your colleagues in the Republican conference, but, I mean, they do control the House. Impeachment is a thing. Chris Ray is still the FBI director. I watched Republicans, some of whom I know, cheer the murder of Ashley Babbitt, who was an unarmed woman, less than 5'5", five five, uh, by Michael Byrd. They were on Michael Byrd's side. And it, I have to say, for a lot of Republican voters, and I count myself among them, very clarifying. If you're cheering Ashley Babbitt's murder, shooting women now, that's okay because she likes Trump. And there are Republicans who are like, yeah, I was happy. Like a lot of them thought that. Like, what the hell? Yeah, that was, and it, it made me sick. Me too. You know, I'm, it, there's a, a great responsibility when you, when you wear a badge in America. I mean, think about it, to be, to be the, to be the designated servant of your community that has, that has the, the authority to, uh, to deny the freedom of a fellow American in the land of the free. Like, that's a heavy responsibility. So the, the escalation of, of force is, it must be appropriate in order to effect a lawful arrest. And and a a bad a bad shoot is the worst thing that an officer can possibly be involved in in his in his career. It's, it's, you know, we it's 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 the thing of nightmares for for good police officers. So to take what was what was, from a law enforcement perspective was clearly a bad shoot because there's some basic rules you just cannot violate. You have to attempt to effect an arrest before you can go to deadly force. There was, there was no attempt to arrest Ashley Babbitt. There were, there were officers on the other side of the window she was climbing through. There were officers 
on the interior side of the window she was climbing through. There was no indication there had been they this had been going on for an hour and there was there was no reports on the radio or anywhere else of of gunfights. So there was no reason at that point to expect that Ashley Babbitt or anybody else in the, in the crowd was going to produce a firearm and start firing on police officers. Why? Because it had not happened. So that's part of the totality of circumstance that a police officer is responsible for knowing. We stay in constant communication with our radios. We know what's going on. Uh, that officer that, that that pulled that trigger which shot a a American woman who was clearly in a in like a physically compromised position, climbing through the broken glass of a of a window is not, you know, it's not like she just stepped into the cage at MMA and she was ready to fight. She's climbing through a window draped in a flag. There's police officers on the other side of the window. There's police officers on the interior side of the window. So you have plenty enough officer presence if you want to arrest that woman and by all means pull her through the window you know put flex cuffs on her and throw her in the corner we'll get to you later ma'am we're kind of busy right now if that's what you do you'd have grabbed that woman and pulled her through flex cuffed her and threw her in the corner or handed her back to somebody that could pull her back you know from that front line right there so i understand that very well understand officers have to make split second decisions, but you never, you never make a decision to use lethal force unless it's absolutely called for and required. If you're losing a fight, attempting to effect an arrest, then, then yeah, you know, if the, if if there's, if if the officer's life is in danger and is all by himself, but. This never should be a circumstance where you just pull the trigger on a woman climbing through a window that's clearly unarmed. There's no evidence of gunplay from the crowd that she's coming from. You got officers on both sides of where she is. If you got to arrest her, then by all means, arrest her. You know, to put flex cuffs on her and and move on so, you know, so you can handle the next person trying to come through the window. But you don't shoot her. So... That was and if a bad you do, shoot. there's an invest a and real was, investigation. It was cheered. Yep. Why do you think that was? And there's this in, there's this insanity that has taken hold in the in the the minds and hearts of many otherwise reasonable American citizens, where they 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 hate Trump so much, like they they're so deeply embedded and they they've sold their souls to the establishment that. When we had an America First president, and and he and he like stopped the uh, the military industrial complex forward momentum, and and he and he began restoring power to individual members of Congress, and restoring individual rights and freedoms and sovereignty of the state, and he took away the actions of the cartels, and 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 brought this uh, this real common sense approach to the executive branch and was leading our country in that beautiful direction. This was interfering with the business model of the establishment. So many career politicians on both sides of the aisle, and I, you know, I don't like those guys, man. I'm not one of them. <laughs> uh, I, I, I serve my country in Congress, but uh, I, I don't consider myself a politician. By any means, I'm a servant to we the people. But some of these guys, man, they pop out of the womb to be to be politicians. They get groomed their whole life, you know, to be a a career politician. And those are the ones that had this instinctive cheer for something really bad happening to a Trump supporter. You know, they their true color showed in that moment, and it was an ugly color. Yeah, that's it. We shouldn't be shooting women, number one. Um, I couldn't agree more. So where, where does this go from here? You have this corpus of information. It sounds like it's definitive. When does the public see the detail? And what's the process after that? It's a good question. So 
evidence from criminal investigations by nature is rather secretive. But there is a, uh, a tremendous compilation of data that I think should be made completely available to the public. And that's the digital files from, from J4, 5, and 6. This is where uh, Speaker Mike Johnson can be a champion for, for that will be remembered for throughout history as the Speaker of the House that fully released, unredacted, uh, digital files from J4, 5, and 6 completely to the American people. And it, within that data it is full truth. And and the American people is the only staff large enough to, you know, frame by frame go through 80,000 hours of digital evidence. And nobody has a staff big enough to do that. But we can crowdsource it to the American people. So you ask, when will this evidence be released? I, I, I've, I've been encouraging Speaker Johnson, as I did Speaker McCarthy, to, by God, man, release this data to the American people. Why won't, why won't they? I believe Speaker Johnson will, but but Mike is a is, is quite a skilled constitutionalist attorney himself, and he's a very measured, patient, faithful man. So I, I have I extend trust to to Speaker Johnson when he says that it's his intention to fully release the the call the J six tapes, but really it's. Digital evidence is more than it's more than just video evidence. It's it's a lot. It's it, you know radio transcripts, the whole thing. Um, 